It is a quick brief presentation. It is a lecture on the Charter Act 1793, the influencing circumstances, the main provisions and the significance of the Charter Act. It is part of the lecture series with a link to a complete, usable answer for examinations. The motive of the partial display and the content of the video. It partially displays the main video of the lecture titled, Charter Act 1793, Circumstances, Provisions, Significance. Only the main provisions of the Charter Act 1793 is streamed herein. It is presented under the impression that studying a long answer to any question in parts helps one grasp the answer. It helps in consolidating the answer. It helps in rewriting the answer in one's own words and phrases. The link to the complete answer is given below in the video's description. The purpose and plan of the lecture is as follows. The lecture is on the topic of the Charter Act 1793. It is based on the content of the book, The History of Constitution of India. The Charter Acts during the company rule in India 1773 to 1858, ISBN 13 978 19830468344 with an OCLC number unique identifier 10861699936. The link to the online purchase of its ebook and paperback copy is given in the video's description. The purpose is to provide a video study aid to the content of the book. The lecture begins now. Now a brief survey of the main provisions of the Charter Act 1793. In the provision one, the company's trade monopoly was extended for 20 years. The private individuals were allowed to trade to the extent of 3,000 tons of shipping. The provision 2. Provided, the members of the Board of Control and its staff were to be paid from India's revenues. As per the provision 3, the Governor Generals and the Governors of the Presidencies were empowered to override the majority in their councils. This power was already given to Governor General Cornwallis in 1788 in the Declaratory Act. The number of members in each council was restricted to three. In the Provision 4, the Governor General in Council was given full power and authority to superintend, direct, and control the presidency governments. When the Governor General visited other presidencies, a provision empowered him to supersede the governor there. As per the provision 5, the governor general was empowered to depute one of the members of his council as the vice president of the council. The vice president was to act for the governor general when the latter was on tour to other presidencies. It was as per the provision 6 that, the governor general, the governors, the commander-in-chief, and some other officers were not permitted to leave India while they held office. This provision continued even when the company was abolished. It was stipulated in Provision 7 that the Commander-in-Chief was removed from the Council of the Governor-General's membership. He was eligible to become a member of the Court of Directors, which deputed him to the Council. In a Provision 8, it was ordained that the Charter reiterated the policy of non-intervention no further conquests, and no further extension of the territories in India. It was declared the British nation's wish, honor, and policy. This policy was inaugurated by the Pitts India Act of 1784 and again reiterated in the Charter Act of 1793. In Provision 9, the rules were laid that, the provision ruled that accepting gifts and presents by British subjects holding any office or employment under the Royal Majesty or the Company was unlawful. It was declared an act of extortion and a misdemeanor at law. The rules in Provision 10 were the following. The Civil Service Rule adopted the principles of grading ranks and seniority in service. Promotion to a higher post was made based on the length of service. Only covenant servants of the company were to be given positions with pay over £500 a year. As per the Provision 11, the sale of liquor was made subject to the grant of a license by the Governor-General. 
who was empowered to levy a sanitary tax in the presidency towns. Now, the specific of Provision 12. The Supreme Court of Calcutta's jurisdiction was extended to the high seas and given admiralty jurisdiction. By the Provision 13, the Governor General was given the power to appoint the members of civil services as justices of peace. It was in the Provision 14. The company's finances were also regulated. Under a provision of the Act, a particular amount was assumed to be the company's annual surplus. Five lakh pounds were allocated from that assumed fund to pay the company's debts.